Public interest. This portion of the meeting is to allow up to three minutes per speaker with 30 total minutes on items of interest or concern and not on items that are on the current agenda. The Planning and Zoning Commission may not discuss these items but may respond with factual or policy information. The Planning and Zoning Commission may choose to place the item on a future agenda. The presiding officer may modify these times as deemed necessary. Yeah. No, we do not. Consent agenda. The consent agenda will be acted upon in one motion and contains items which are routine and typically non-controversial. Items may be removed from this agenda for individual consideration by commissioners or staff. Would anyone like to remove an item from the consent agenda? Seeing none. Move approval of the consent agenda as presented. I'll second it. I have a motion by Commissioner Ratliff to approve the consent agenda with a second by Commissioner Carey. Please vote. We're missing somebody, aren't we? Uh, oh, that's right. Well, there's only seven of us. Wow. Yeah, Mr. Horn is no longer with us. Okay. That item carries seven to zero. Uh, I do want to make a point of thanking uh, Commissioner Tong for being here, despite being uh, hobbled slightly. She evidently tried to jump off a mountain understand exactly why, but uh, anyway, <laughs> I understand the view was amazing. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. All right, item one. Items for individual consideration, public hearing items. Unless instructed otherwise by the chair, speakers will be called upon in the order registrations are received. Applicants are limited to 15 minutes of presentation time with a five minute rebuttal needed. Remaining speakers are limited to 30 total minutes of testimony time with three minutes assigned per speaker. The presiding officer may modify these times as deemed necessary. Administrative consideration items must be approved if they meet city development regulations. Legislative consideration items are more discretionary except as constrained by legal considerations. Agenda item number one, public hearing read plat. PSW Homes Edition Block A Lots 1 through 6. Six urban residential lots on 1.3 acres located at the southwest corner of I Avenue and 17th Street. Zoned urban residential and located within the Hagger Park Heritage Resource Overlay District HD20. Applicant petitioner, I'm sorry, applicant is SB Downtown Plano LLC. This is for administrative consideration. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Donna Sepulveda, senior planner with the planning department. This item is recommended for approval as submitted, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Any questions for staff on this item? Commissioner Riley. Just a quick question. Is this, I thought this had more lots originally. Has it always been six? It's one right now, and they're subdividing into well, six lots. I know, but the, in the, the last go round, was it not more lots than that originally in the, the preliminary plan? I believe it's always been the same number okay. of lots. There was maybe. a final plot um, a few weeks ago, for just one lot adjacent to this property. Maybe that's what I'm thinking yeah. of. Okay, thank you. Um, all right. A quick question. Um, just looking at this plot, there seemed to be a very narrow uh, property on the side. Is that another lot? Is it kind of towards, it looks like there's, that's the seventh. Uh, in addition to the six, they're dedicating an alley. Oh, there's that's, that's your alley. alley. Okay, good. thank you, Commissioner Carey. Yeah, um, as as I look at the plot plan, a couple of the lots are significantly smaller than the other ones, and and I assume that you know it was like seventy one hundred square feet. I assume that that they'll be able to build um, as they desire on there what they need. But were there any concerns with the consistency of the development based on? One of the lots being so much smaller than the other. I mean, will that will they be able to build something there that that is all looks consistent? Yes, we did review this with the um, zoning district, urban residential, and it does meet the minimum lot size requirements. Okay. Thank you. Also, add, Commissioner, that this is in the located in the Haggard Park Heritage District, and the Heritage Commission has approved the the plans for these homes. Thank you. I had that thought or question. Any other questions for staff on the side? Thank you very much. I'll open the public hearing. Do we have any speakers on this item? 
Uh, we do not, but the applicant is here to answer any questions from the commission. All right, thank you. Any questions for the applicant? Okay, we'll close the here and we can find discussion of the commission. I move we accept this as submitted. I have a motion by Commissioner Bronski with a second by Commissioner Bronoff to accept the uh, item one as submitted. Please vote. That item carries seven to zero. Item two. Agenda item number two, public hearing replat. Twin Rivers at Collin Creek, Block A, Lot 1, independent living facility on one lot on 8.3 acres located on the west side of Alma Drive, 932 feet south of Park Boulevard. Zone plan development, 60 general office. office. Applicant is Twin Rivers at Collin Creek Limited. This is for administrative consideration. This item is recommended for approval and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions for staff on this item? Seeing none, thank you very much. I'll open the public here. Do we have any speakers on this item? We do. We have uh, Travis Thompson. Good evening. Give us your name and address, and <coughs> thanks for joining us. Hi, good evening. My name is Travis Thompson, and my address is 3903 Morning Dove in Carrollton, Texas. Um, really, I know this is an agenda item that I don't want to take up much time. I just wanted to thank everyone at Plano, um, everyone on city staff, everyone for working with us. Uh, Twin Rivers is a um, senior housing uh, community, and uh, we look forward to you know housing those people in Plano. They're hoping to stay within the city limits. It's a 55 and over. Uh, active adult community. Um, we really have enjoyed our time so far working with Plano, uh, everyone at the city, um, from the building permitting process, and hopefully we have our CO here very soon. Um, but it's been uh, it's been a pleasure working here. We look forward to expanding our our company in Plano and working with all of you guys um, and uh, everyone at the city has been has been uh, a pleasure. And uh, we're hopefully in February, give or take, we're going to have a grand opening. And everyone's going to be invited, so I hope uh, everyone can come out and uh, look forward to being part of the community. Thank you so much for coming. Sure. Nice words. Yeah. Any, <laughs> any, if you have any questions at all, um, feel free to reach out. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other speakers? No, we do not. All right. I'll close the public here. Anyone want to vote no after that? <laughs> I move we uh, accept this as submitted. Okay. Second. I say all right, so I have a motion by Commissioner Bronski with a second by Commissioner Ali to approve item two as submitted. Please vote. And that item carries seven to zero. Thanks again for being here. Thanks. Item three. Agenda item number three, public hearing replat. Carter Craft Edition, Block A, Lot 1R. Indoor Commercial Amusement, Health Fitness Center, and Warehouse Distribution Center on one lot on 9.8 acres located on the south side of 14th Street, 341 feet west of Millard Millard Drive, Zone Light Industrial One. Applicant is Cantex 1714 LLC. This is for administrative consideration. Good evening, everyone. My name is Katja Copeland. I'm the senior planner with the planning department. This item is recommended for approval as submitted, and I would be pleased to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions for staff on this item? Seeing none, thank you. I'll open the public hearing. Any discussion? There's no any speakers. Any discussions? Any speakers? No, there are not. Okay. Now I'll ask for any discussion. I'll close. The Commissioner Britt Bradley. I move we approve agenda item three as submitted. Three. Three. Second. <laughs> All right. Motion by Commissioner Ratliff. Second by Commissioner Bronski to approve item three. Please vote. <clears throat> and that item carries seven to zero. Agenda item number four, public hearing, preliminary replat, Atlantic Richfield subdivision, block A, lot 1R, professional general administrative office and warehouse distribution center on one lot on 64.4 acres, located on the south side of Plano Parkway, 454 feet west of Custer Road. 
zoned light industrial one and located within the 190 Tollway Plano Parkway Overlay District. Applicant is Liberty Venture One Holdings, LLC. This is for administrative consideration. This item is recommended for approval subject to additions or alterations provided by the engineering department. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Questions for staff on this item? Thank you. The public hearing any speakers on this item? No, there are not. I will close the public hearing. Confined discussion with the commission. Commissioner Bronson. I move we approve this subject to additions and or alterations to the engineering plans as required by the engineering department. I second. It's a motion by Commissioner Bronski with a second by Commissioner Tong to approve item four as presented by staff. Please vote. Item carries seven to zero. Non-public hearing <laughs> items. The presiding officer will permit limited public comment for items on the agenda not posted for a public hearing. The presiding officer will establish time limits based upon the number of speaker requests, length of the agenda, and to ensure meeting efficiency and make include a total time limit. Agenda item number five, discussion and direction. Thoroughfare Standards Rules and Regulations Update. Discussion and direction pertaining to Section 13, Neighborhood Traffic Management, as part of the update of the City's Thoroughfare Standards Rules and Regulations. Applicant is City of Plano. Good evening, Commissioners. My name is Jason April. I'm the Senior Mobility Planner with the Planning Department. The Planning and Engineering Departments are working to update the City's Thoroughfare Standards, Rules and Regulations, known more simply as the Thoroughfare Standards. This document regulates the minimum standards for the design and construction of streets, sidewalks, and other roadway design elements within the City. This includes technical specifications for items such as street curvature and alignment, intersection design, driveway access control, turn lane requirements, and other technical requirements. This was last updated in 2009, and the city has contracted with Kimley Horn and Associates to assess the existing thoroughfare standards and develop a new transportation design manual. And as I presented in previous meetings, we're aiming to finalize this in the spring, so the spring of this year. <clears throat> Section 13, Neighborhood Traffic Management, adds to the current thoroughfare standards by incorporating details and the overall planning and design of traffic calming methods to reduce the speed and volume of vehicular traffic by responding directly to expressed community needs. The updates are guided by policies and actions within the transportation and housing and neighborhoods components of the comprehensive plan, including the roadway system <coughs> policy and action one of the neighborhood conservation policy. The City of Plano previously administered a safe streets program that addressed neighborhood traffic concerns through a transportation advisory committee, which acted as a review and advisory board for neighborhood traffic management programs. The safe streets program was discontinued in 2008, and since that time, the city has limited traffic calming options primarily to maintenance of existing speed bumps currently. Section 13 will provide an updated process for neighborhoods to petition for the installation of traffic calming devices. A citizen or a neighborhood association may request that a particular street or area be considered for neighborhood traffic management improvements. Section 13 will outline the request, the design, the outreach, and approval process as shown in the flowchart of the PowerPoint. The applicant for a traffic management request must complete a project request application, including their specific location and the reasoning behind the request. Then the item moves where the city will review the eligibility of each request based on program objectives and policies. During that review period, the city will consider requests and determine the viability and the study limits of um, the area. The study area will be based on the facility being analyzed. After the city has selected a project area, city staff will review traffic data and the list of available traffic calming tools to develop possible solutions to address the given traffic conditions. Next, city staff will notify business and property owners in the project area. Outreach could include introductory meetings with the neighborhood to discuss their traffic concerns 
and an open house to present the design concept toward the end. The neighborhood traffic management plan will be voted on by the neighborhood because the plan is a system of integrated calming devices. Individual streets or devices cannot be taken out of the proposal as part of the vote. The vote is either a yes or no to adopt the traffic management plan as a complete package. That's a, a very high level of the process. There are many devices available to the city to address neighborhood traffic concerns. Some are used to address vehicular speed, others to address cut through traffic issues, and others to enhance pedestrian safety. The city desires to implement devices that are both functional and aesthetically pleasing. There are various speed management techniques that could be applied, including visually narrowing techniques, horizontal deflection, and vertical deflection. Visually narrowing techniques, these utilize either physical objects, vertical street elements, or pavement markings to communicate to the driver a perceived narrowing of their anticipated path of travel and in hopes of reducing operating speeds. These can include designated marking spaces to narrow the street. Vehicles tend to slow in areas with more on-street parking, essentially. And street trees also help to visually narrow the street. For horizontal deflection, these are traffic calming techniques that aim to force the driver to respond to a changing width or alignment of their anticipated travel path. This response of the driver typically results in a lowering of operating speeds. And there's a wide variety of horizontal deflection um, points, and I'll go through each item quickly. Median islands. The first horizontal deflection traffic calming technique includes median islands or raised central islands. These reduce the lane width and vehicular speed, provide an aesthetically visual breakup, and provide visual cues to the drivers that they need to slow down. They are typically not recommended in areas with a lot of freight traffic or industrial areas. Next, we have pin, pinch points. Pinch point is a curb extension applied mid-block to allow traffic speeds while, um, to slow traffic speeds while also adding to the public realm. They provide shorter pedestrian crossing distances and can protect the beginning of an on-street parking lane. Next, a chicane is essentially a serpentine curve in the road. And you can see in the photo, the road's kind of curving to the right and then to the left. These can slow drivers while also increasing the amount of public space available along the corridor. Another horizontal deflection device, striping, um, as a traffic calming technique that can help reduce the driver's perceived width of the roadway. Striping can be implemented quickly. It can be less costly than others to construct and allows for greater flexibility in the future if the city decides to make future changes to um, the area. Next, a diverter is a device that limits through movements for traffic. It reduces the speed at an intersection approach as well as potential vehicular conflicts. Special considerations for diverters should be made for emergency vehicles, school buses, and delivery trucks. Next, traffic circles. A traffic circle is a central island painted or raised, and in this photo, it's raised. Um, with a vertical mountable curb in the center of the intersection of two streets, and traffic circles are intended to be yield operated intersections. Mini roundabouts are intersections with circulating traffic that yield at entry. They are used to move <coughs> traffic on neighborhood collector roads with higher volume. The main uses of mini roundabouts are to increase the capacity of existing four way stops and where approaching site distance is limited. Mini roundabouts, though similar, they are different from track circles in that they require deflection of the vehicle paths prior to entry into the in intersection. And you can see on the image, the lanes turning into the roundabout, <coughs> they're kind of guided, so they're deflected into the roundabout. Um, and those are typically, so that the um, deflections are typically made through the use of curved or painted islands. Next, raised intersections, they're flat raised areas covering an entire intersection that create a safe, slow speed crossing in public space. They're flush with the sidewalk and ensure that drivers travel over them more slowly. 
they're typically best used in denser, more mixed-use areas and areas with really um, a lot higher pedestrian volumes. Next, pedestrian bulb outs are used at the intersection to narrow the street at the location where pedestrians cross the street. When they're combined with on-street parking, the corner extension can create, can create protected on-street parking. They provide shorter pedestrian crossing distances and protection at the beginning of a parking lane. Next, vertical deflection. These are isolated increase in the normal pavement elevation that <coughs> encourages the driver to slow their vehicle speed. Some examples are speed cushions. These are devices intended to slow traffic speeds on low speed roads. They are seen as favorable over speed humps because they allow emergency vehicles to pass at fairly normal uh, speeds. Raised crosswalks are constructed along an elongated mound in the roadway pavement surface extending across the travel way at a right angle to the traffic flow. They encourage motorists to travel at slower speeds while increasing the sight distance to the pedestrians who are crossing. And finally, speed humps. Um, they're typically placed on uh, type E, F, and G roads. They cannot be placed in front of driveways and are generally not appropriate for a primary emergency vehicle route. And then the final item, we recommend that the commission provide direction pertaining to section 13, the neighborhood traffic management, as part of the update of the city's thoroughfare standard rules and regulations. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you very much, appreciate that. Um, I really thought this section was great, the way it's organized and put together. And um, we needed a new process for mm -hmm. you know, citizens or organizations to apply for changes to uh, a street design or typically you know, speeding in the, in the neighborhood. So uh, appreciate that. Uh, Commissioner Bronoff, you have yes. a comment? I have a question for the staff. Sure, yes. absolutely. Um, the procedure you've outlined is for the neighborhood to file a, a, an application or a request with the city to institute a traffic <clears throat> modifying plan of some kind. Do I understand correctly that uh, the application is merely a general application for, for traffic management plan, but the city staff will actually design the components of the plan. Is that right? Yes, that is correct. Whether to use roundabouts or rollabouts or, or chicanes or whatever. Yes, that okay. is correct. Um, I like the idea of traffic schools, and I'm not convinced that they're only appropriate for, for lower volume streets. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there, there could be a place for a traffic circle on Preston Road at certain intersections. I mean, the traffic doesn't have to stop for lights. You're not going to clog up the street with three lanes of traffic, stop for a red light so that, you know, like a police car or an ambulance can't get through. Um, you know, uh, combined with appropriate, uh, you know, speed limit restrictions, warning signs, and so forth, maybe some sort of horizontal narrowing leading into it. Um, I, I think it's a good idea. Thank you. Thank you. And I do want to say, I forgot to mention that Chad Ostrander from the engineering department, he's a traffic engineer, is here to answer any of the engineering <laughs> specific questions. So just so that everyone's clear, this we're talking specifically this evening about 13. Correct. So questions, comments really focus on what was presented tonight. Um, Commissioner Ali. Um, two questions. Well, one question, one comment. The traffic management plan, the petition, do we have some kind of standardized template that will be available to the public for them to fill that would guide them to certain criteria that would perhaps enhance their chances of getting an approval, you know, rather than, you know, random reasonings for why a traffic management plan uh, would be needed in the neighborhood? So you're asking if there was a standardized form that they could fill Template out? Template form, something that... Hello, again, I, my name is Chad Ostrander, a traffic engineer for uh, engineering, in the engineering department. Um, currently, we use a, a petition process. Um, when a, a citizen comes to us with a complaint, we're, we're basing this off of our alley speed bump program, which we currently use through our public work department. Um, when they request speed bumps in their alley, 
we work with them to determine how large of an area that this would affect. With an alley, it's easy because you look at who all's along that alley or maybe side alleys. And we ask them uh, to go to those houses and we say, okay, we need 70% of the people in, that's affected by that to say, yes, we also want a speed bump in this alley. Um, and then we would work with them to install. So we're gonna go up on a similar process with this. Um, obviously it, it's a street, so it affects a lot more people. Mm -hmm. So on the city side, when they come to us, we would work with that resident and say, okay, we think that this area is going to be affected by your request. We are not just looking at your one street, we're looking at your neighborhood. So for right. example, Legacy Independence, if someone comes and wants a speed cushion or something on Mom L, we would also look at all of the, all the streets in that neighborhood as well. Um, and we would request that that citizen either either go to that HOA or go door to door and, and put in a little bit of effort on their end to prove to us that it is a concern that is wide, widely held within that area. And it's not just me and my neighbor want this speed bump in front of our house. It, it, is, a, it is a concern that multiple people in the area have before the city commits their resources to do the analysis and the, the design. Agreed. I guess what I'm looking for is, is there some way to filter so that we don't unnecessarily, because every parent wants speed bumps in front of their house, all right? Um, so that we don't essentially generate, and I can get all my neighbors to say, <laughs> say the same thing who are parents, that we don't generate multiple requests just because some little kid is speeding 10 miles above the speed limit, no. And that is there some template that could almost guide like this are uh, multiple occurrences of traffic accidents or um, you must first have filed a complaint with the police or, or you know, something that kind of any, like streamlines it. Any request that comes to us, we're gonna find them, we're gonna point them to the petition process and have them put in that effort to, to gather more consent than just themselves. So that's um, our weeding process generally, is the effort they would require. What we've, exactly. What we've okay. seen with the alley speed bump program is we have a complaint. And if we ask that person who has put in the complaint to provide a little bit of effort on their part, if it's genuine and they go through that effort, then it, then, then it's, it's worth our time to help them. But if we, if, if we give them, okay, you have to put in a little effort and then back off, maybe it's not that big of a concern. Uh, the second question slash comment, the raised intersection, um, does that have markings, just visual markings to kind of warn the driver that that's coming? Yes, typically. Oh, because I've bumped over one or two in my, in my day because I didn't quite expect it. The, the way that I've seen it, it could be painted or it could be something done with the brick or the pavement infrastructure to let the drivers know the raised intersections are a little different than what they're driving on. Okay. Thank you. Visual cues. I think I wanna elaborate on something. There is a process right now for people to apply for a speed bump or get something. So it's not, that doesn't exist right now. This is just going to more clearly state and outline the policies and the types of um, traffic calming methods that can be used. So I, I think this as much as anything else is to kind of clean up something we have in place and make it a little easier for people to understand here's what's required if you want to do it. Instead of it being, the Wild West is the wrong term for it. It's just not something that's been very clearly uh, uh, spelled out. So it, it should make it easier for people, but at the same time, the amount of work is still required. I don't think we'll have a, hopefully not inundated. Uh, Commissioner Kerry, I think you were. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, and I was one of the questions I was going to ask because I got the impression there might not be a process in place. But so thanks for clarifying that. Um, so I have a, just a couple quick questions. I think um, one of my first ones is: Do you believe this will increase the number of um, requests, or might it streamline them? And 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 a piggyback on that is: If it's if we look and it's going to increase them. 
Um, how about the, the workload? I'm just curious about all of that as you guys think this through, how you think it moves through our city. For your first question, will it increase? I, I haven't increased the number of cases. I, I wouldn't, I don't think it would. I think it'll streamline. If someone does have an issue, they'll know a little easier where to find that and go to the thoroughfare standards. Um, you want to say something? So a lot of our job currently is responding to citizen requests and we have the fix it Plano system I'm sure you're, you're familiar with. Um, we get probably 50% of our, of our requests that come to the transportation department is people requesting speed bumps already. And right now with the, the current system, um, we have to tell them that there is not currently a system in place to put speed bumps on roadways. There is an alleys but not on, not on roadways. And we work with them in other ways. We work with Sergeant Kevin Lemon uh, from the police fork department um, to uh, do speed studies to see if, if, there, is, if there is an issue, um, both blind uh, so that there, you can't see any, any sort of detection equipment. And then we put out a speed trailer that the drivers see, okay, they're monitoring our speed and we, we see if, if there's any difference there. Um, and then if, if there is a concern, then uh, the, the police will, will increase presence in an area, um, our current process. And we get a lot of those. Uh, we probably get 30 of those a month. So it may be that this reduces this, the workload somewhat with some more thoughtful approach. This transfers the workload, I think. It, yeah, it, it takes some of the effort off of our police. Um, and uh, they'll still be involved. Um, they, they have all of the, the speed detection equipment in the city. And when we're doing our analysis from, from an engineering standpoint, we will work with them still. Um, but it gives a solution other than let's increase police presence. Okay. Let's, Great. Well, we can put a design out there that's more. Okay. Fun. Well, I just got a couple other real quick things. Then, uh, can I? Yes, sure. I, I want to, just because I'm, you've stated that we don't have a process for getting speed bumps installed, yet I do remember, well, granted, it's been five years ago, though, it coming to council and approval of speed bumps being approved, being installed because of citizen brought it forward and the police did their study and they said, you know what, this is not a bad idea. So I'm, I'm, you stated that there wasn't a process for that to happen, but I've seen that, it happen. That might have been a, a more complex process that involved some okay. engineering design I, I on just the want, back end. I just want to make clear that there is a process for citizens right now to deal with speeding, et cetera, that goes beyond just a police presence. Because yes. I've, I've seen that. It's just not <laughs> streamlined and clearly defined. So this may present greater opportunities for citizens to get traffic calming devices installed. Uh, the question will still come down to the work they've got to put in and an analysis by staff to say, to have the desired results, et cetera. Because one thing the city's also looking at is any of these installations create additional infrastructure maintenance requirements, et cetera. Uh, so, Anyway, yeah. I didn't mean to cut you no, off. That's okay. I just was hearing Great. two different things here, and I just wanted to make That's it. fantastic clarification. Uh, you know, our, our chairman earlier talked about this plan, and I, I have to echo that. I think it's, it's great. Um, and I think you're leaned into some best practices. And so uh, one, I just have a couple more quick questions. One is, out of these horizontal deflection devices, is there any difference in the safety that they provide from using them? I mean, in the best practices? You sort it through it. Does some provide more safety? I, I would assume they all provide some speed deflection, but or calming. Um. The document, as we're putting it together, has a list of pros and cons and best practices for each. I did not include that in the presentation, but there are pros and cons in terms of safety for each of the horizontal deflections. So if it's based on pedestrian safety, or th there are different categories. I was just curious. There are pros and cons in here. Again, the report's very well done. And my final thing is just a comment on the vote. And as I read that, you know, neighbors may get to vote on it, it, it caused me to pause to go, wow, um, obviously our city's going to weigh in on what the best thing is. And it's, uh, to, to quote the chairman, it's not a Wild West thing. But I wonder at times if we allow everybody to vote, if that's the final word, if that might be the best solution. And if it's not, what, what mechanisms do we have to say, okay, Pro these guys probably should have voted for this, and for whatever reason they're not. Are there 
are there remedies we have in the event that maybe the citizens vote for something that's really needed, but they vote it down? Well, I would say, so you're saying it gets all the way through the plan approval process, but then it's not approved. So right. there's, there's a component of it. I, I would say kind of back to the city to work through, correct? Yeah, maybe that's not defined. It was just something that occurred to me. I, and, and maybe it's not that, that uh, relevant right now, but. Yeah, so the, the city has multiple checks in this process. During the project eligibility review, before it goes to design, the city is gonna take, it, if, if it passes petition, and it's, it's clear that this is an issue that has a lot of concern behind it. Um, the city will determine, okay, is this something that these tools can solve or is it something that um, the, it, is, it is worth, we'll, we'll, do, we'll look at the speeds, we'll look at the, the potential crashes that have been in the area in the past, we'll look at um, the, the volume of traffic in that area and see is this something that is worthy to put our, our budget to. Um, a lot of times we would have uh, several projects or several areas that would be of concern, but our budget is limited and we, we can only focus on this one area this year. It stays in the queue and we can, we can review it again next year. Um, so once it gets past that city check and do the design, that last vote, it, we would go to them with one or maybe two design solutions that our consult would come up with. Um, and if, if they choose to go with one of those solutions, um, the city would commit to maintain those. Uh, and if they chose to go with a no build solution, that would be on the, the neighborhood to, they, 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 they're fine with the status quo rather than having these, these tools implemented in their area. I guess it's my point, not very well made, maybe, was that there may be times where the city needs to put a safety device there that the citizens may be against. So I'll just leave it with that. But thank you very much, guys. And uh, I, I, sorry, I see what you're saying. If, if we go through a process every year from a, an engineering standpoint, we're just starting it now, where we're analyzing all of the accident locations in the city. And if we see... Um, an issue that that is that stands out from the data that that we do on our own, we would move to address that outside of this Perfect. process. Yes. Commissioner Bronski, you had your light on two or three times here, but uh, <laughs> what did you go? He got cut off. Sorry. Uh, so I, he's probably going to need to come back up. Yeah. Sorry, Chad. Sorry. I have a couple questions. Let's start with. Um, the outreach process. Uh, one of the things that we made very clear in the comprehensive plan was about proactively s seeking community input. And so my first question is, um, how, how carefully or what is the process that we currently go through and is it going to change at all based on this process to ensure that we're collecting as much information as we can from as many people that happen to be impacted as possible especially considering uh, we have a lot more technology at our hands rather than just sending mail now. So our current, our current process does involve sending mail. Um, it's, it's the easiest from the city side. We've got all their addresses and we can just, if someone sends a petition and we determine that they are in the, in the area, we will send a mailer to both the tenant and if it's, if it's a rented location, tenant and property owner, um, however, just the property owner would be um, allowed a vote in that case, which I, I think is detailed in the document that we sent them. They don't have the full document that's not in staff report at the moment. Okay. Um, so that, I, I think that report will come later. We're still working through those details. Um, so the, the outreach portion is, is laid out in, with a, uh, once it gets to outreach past design, um, we, we intend to hold a couple of public meetings. Um, the first, the first public meeting would be, and, and we would announce it to, yeah, uh, the residents that were affected both by mailer. We, we may work with our, our, uh, social media team to put it out through other channels. 
um, to discuss what concerns those residents have. Um, and that way we can address those when, we, uh, when we're looking at the design. Um, that would happen in, in collaboration with the design step. Then once we get through design, we would have another public meeting where we would present our solutions, um, gain comment back, ad address any comments if needed, um, and then go to a vote either on that meeting if, if it is ready or on a third public meeting um, if, if we need to go back to the drawing board and address things that come from the second public meeting. the same process the same process that we're currently doing um, or are we going to expand the ability to reach for outreach to occur question wasn't are we going to keep doing mail but it was are we so one of the things that I think uh, and I think the city received an award for was the uh, radar recognition for zoning cases people being able to say okay I want to know what's going on in the areas and then they're getting communications when things like that are going on uh, so my question was, you know, maybe uh, I drive through uh, and have significant impact at uh, Custer and Plano Parkway, and I might like to at least be aware that something's looking at changing at that intersection. Um, and so my question was about how we're ensuring that we're proactively capturing everybody that could possibly be affected or might want to have at least some knowledge of it. So I, I understand what you're saying. So to the design phase, that's kind of when the study area is assigned, but you're talking about communication for even if you're outside of the study area. Um, and I can say right now, I, I don't believe that is spelled out in the document right now. Um, and I can discuss that with Kim Lee Horn, kind of get some better best practices on that mm -hmm. component about outreach to people outside of the study area about notification and noticing. Uh, so. Uh, can I ask a question? I mean, why? I mean, the focus here really is on these neighborhood traffic calming. And I think that, for example, if this said <clears throat> our plan is to add 150 of these or 25 even throughout the city over the next, then it would be something I would probably have more concerns with instead of it simply saying, here's elements that we can use for traffic calming in places where local citizens have asked for help. So I'm not sure what the benefit is or the need is for a much broader request for public input into an area that's only, you know, a small area that's being impacted. So, so that was simply an example. I wasn't looking oh, to actually okay. have that happen. I just wanted to know. Were we going beyond sending letters sending out? Letters. Okay. Were, were we working to use all of our different options to communicate? Well, and I, I guess to some degree you might, again, the social media platform might help you narrow it down a little bit. And if it's in an HOA, they likely have an email address list, for example. But in a non-HOA area, I'm not sure how you would get the email addresses for all of those. I just, okay. Yeah. And you're not done yet, and I know Commissioner Rattle, if you have a question, too. Uh, my second question was, uh, in the document, uh, on page three, it talks about uh, the vote is either yes or no to adopt the proposed management plan as a complete package. But you made a comment just a minute ago that we might present two of them and let them choose between them. Yes. How so does... the, intent, the intent is to get to 51% on one of the options. So if they were to... If we, were, if we were to present three options, if our consultant decided that since there are so many tools in the toolbox, there are multiple ways to skin this cat, we could present many roundabouts or traffic circles, or we could go with chicanes and, and pinch points. Um, then if, if, a, if a neighborhood voted and it, there were two that stood out, but they didn't quite reach 51%, runoff vote between those two um, and the, with the intent to get to 51% of the, the active voters de determining which option they, they like best. Yeah, okay. That and that, that's if we have multiple options. A lot of times we'll only have one option and it'll be between build or no build. But yeah, so, at that point it's either yes or no. Yes. At the very end. Exactly. My last, uh, my last thing is more of a comment. Uh, in looking at 
uh, pages seven and eight, talking about traffic circles and many roundabouts, I've got to agree with uh, Commissioner Brunoff that um, uh, some of the pros and cons that have listed there, I kind of struggle with because I've been stuck at many an intersection where a uh, stoplight and emergency vehicles are unable to get through altogether um, because of a red light, whereas uh, having traffic circles and roundabouts would make things much more efficient. Uh, we would also reduce safety uh, response cost to our police department as well as uh, our fire departments. Uh, and so uh, I just struggle with a little bit of the pros and cons that you've listed there because I, I, I think they could be a little bit. Uh, there are cons to those, but I don't necessarily agree with those. So thank you so much for your effort. Uh, I, I'm very excited that we are going to streamline this process and uh, help all of our citizens be more secure in knowing exactly what steps to take to make things like this happen. So thank you. I think, again, this is focused on neighborhoods, so not our main thoroughfares. So the application of traffic circles might very well work in some of our main thoroughfares. I, I think that's something up for more discussion. Um, and I know it's just a phrase, but I'm sure he's no offense to any cat owners out there. <laughs> um, Commissioner Ratliff, I think you were next. I want to try to get everyone who hasn't spoke a chance to speak, and then we can come back to uh, Commissioner Ratliff. Um, thank you. First of all, very thorough, very well done. I appreciate the explanation of the issues. Um, Jen, as you roll this out to the neighborhoods, um, one thing that you all have done extraordinarily where in the past is putting together a flow chart of if I'm the resident, I start here, and this is what I've got to do, and this is what you do. I understand what's on the screen right now is a very simplified version of that, but um, are y'all going to put together a little more detailed one for the residents? Yes. So we actually had a call with Kimley Horn today, and one of the comments was to add a process chart for this section. So a little bit, a little bit more detailed than the flow chart on the PowerPoint that was kind of for the presentation in the staff report. But yes, there would be a process chart. Great. So we did discuss that today. I felt certain y'all were, but I felt the need to add it. Um, second, uh, to the chairman's point, we're talking about neighborhood traffic devices. At what level, I, mean, I know obviously residential streets and collectors, but at what level does it become beyond neighborhood? I mean, obviously major arterials, minor arterials, where do you consider to be the cutoff point of where this petition process would apply? I think it's, I'm not, I'm not really sure. Um, yeah, I, I viewed it as um, type uh, E, F, and G, and down for most of these. Um, I don't know. I think so it will depend what the we, petition is. We would not intend for these, these type of tools to be used on the coordinated traffic system. Um, that would... I think that would hurt things more than help things, um, with the exception of, of possibly a, a, a larger roundabout at, at an intersection if that was determined that the need was there um, and that it was beneficial. Um, the so there there are some areas, especially on the north side of Plano possibly near Ohio and, and like Kennison area um, where there are, there are some larger collectors. Um, like I think T Wood, I think is one of them. Um, and we get a lot of requests in that area right now. Um, that is a, a little larger, but I think it's still type, type E or F. Um, so we, we don't intend for in anything larger than that. I think it would be helpful if you would just to clarify that this would not apply, definitely not apply to which categories it definitely would be available in these categories. And in special circumstances, we would look at these categories or something. Just so when somebody comes in, they can go, I've got a really problem with the traffic on Preston Road and I've got a petition. Well, it's probably beyond a petition. Um, you know, that's a pretty major thoroughfare. Um, and so I think it might help it to know if I'm a resident coming in, where are the boundary lines, where are the bookends on this process? Um, just a suggestion. It's a great point. And then last but not least, um, is there any place in Plano where you've used a chicane? And the reason I ask that is because 
I'm aware of a, another North Texas city that put them in a few years ago and they lasted about two years and they took them out. So Ch chicanes are definitely one of the more controversial of these tools um, where they, where they excel is on uh, smaller neighborhood streets that have a lot of pedestrian traffic potentially near a park um, really slows people down. Um, it, that they don't do great things for emergency response. Um, Plano has not put any in, but I know McKinney and Prosper and some of the, the incorporated neighborhoods up near Aubrey have, have put them in and there are varying levels of success with that. My, my personal experience has been they work great during the day, not well at night. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think it brings up a good question. I didn't hit it, but <laughs> and that is, you know, we could throw everything, including the kitchen sink, in here. But if we're not going to use it, I mean, I guess you want the tool in your toolkit, right? But I think it would have to be a very unique circumstance to put something like that in. And if you look at our overall city layout and went, yeah, I just don't see any place where that's going to go. Again. I guess it helps to have everything in your toolkit. That way you don't have to ask for special permission later on. But. No, that one would be a very special situation, I would hope. Yeah. So, okay. Commissioner Ratliff, go Thank ahead. Thank you very Sorry, much. I didn't mean to interrupt. No, you. no, that's fine. I agree with you. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Tom, yes. I have a, a couple of questions. Actually, uh, Commissioner Ratliff uh, asked half of my question already, like coming in to this petition point, if someone you know, see some traffic issues at a bigger intersection uh, other than the neighborhood, would they come to this file petition traffic for management plan um, or not? You know, the, 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 the citizens need to know what circumstances they have before they come to here, right? So that's part of the, uh, uh, the question that uh, Commissioner Ralph had. And the other half question I have regarding that is coming out of this process, right? So in the neighborhood, so it's very well that, like for example, um, Ohio and Quincy, right? A couple years ago, you put a traffic light there, but there was no traffic light before. It was considered a neighborhood street. There was just a stop sign for many years. So if someone thinks, oh, this is my neighborhood, I petitioned for the traffic plan, uh, sorry, the traffic measure plan for a change because there are too many accidents, people missed the stop sign, didn't stop, and and then in, in the end, the outcome could be a traffic light or it could be a, has to be a hard stop stop sign in addition to all these uh, traffic calming uh, methods. So should that also be considered in a part of this plan or would, is there another plan that will complement this? I'll take that. Mm -hmm. um, so to your first question about <laughs> coming in here, I think that's part of the... Uh, what should a citizen know? Yes. Can okay. they know, hey, you know what? I could get a group of neighbors together and we can go change the way they manage traffic on Preston Road. Yes. So... Yeah. Nope, absolutely not. It only applies up to this level of roadway. We, we will, in this document, we will... As, as Jason said, we will set limits of, of where, yeah. what, what level of thoroughfare this applies to. However, there is still tools within the city of Plano to let us know about concerns that they have. Um, okay. We have the fix it system um, and we get requests on that to <clears throat> go look at certain, certain aspects of, of major intersections that, that people do find um, of concern, um, or they call in uh, to to the numbers listed on the website, and we get the, the, the we get the same response. Uh, we'll go out and we'll we'll we'll, val we'll validate concern, and we'll address it. But that that doesn't fall through this process. So there um, is another process. So when you get uh, the, the petition, you will have to sort it out. That one. If it's so, this this is we this is the city is going to install infrastructure, ma quite a major infrastructure in an, in a large scale setting, and the level of effort required for that requires the petition. With with other concerns, it's 
they can go through the fix it system or email or call us um, with the concerns and we will work through our day-to-day -day tasks with them to, val to validate that concern. And if, if there is uh, something that we can do to fix it, then we will uh, work with them to fix that. For example, there, there was a, a faulty pedestrian uh, button out on Preston Road the other week and someone called that in and I went out and we, we, check, we checked it, validated that there was issues with the call and we fixed it and now it's working. Um, so th there, are, um, there are processes that a citizen can take for, for the larger intersections, but it's, it's much simpler and it's already in place with the fix it system. Okay, so when the concerns come in, you can tell them, okay, this do not belong to the petition process. You don't have to file a petition. You can just, we can just go out and fix that. Yes. Okay. So the, gotcha. the intent is that when they come to the city, they could either go through our, uh, we'll probably have a form online that will file a petition. And if, if we notice that this petition came in or this petition request came in and it's something that could be handled through fix it, we would transfer it to that system and we would address it in the matter. Or if, it, if, if a petition request like this came through fix it, we would get with that citizen and point them to the petition form so that they could properly use that system. Okay, sounds good. Uh, the so, second half yeah, of your question. The second half. You said coming out mm -hmm. of this system. Yes. Can you remind me of, of that question? I apologize. Oh. So right now, your solutions are all these traffic calming, like speed bombs, roundabouts. Uh, it does not have any like stop signs or, or traffic, traffic lights, signal. right? Yes. So what if the petition came in and it turned out to be, even though it's a small street, maybe just Quincy, <coughs> maybe it's just, you know, like um, Preston Meadow, but it turned out to be a larger project and then you have to put a stop sign or you have to put a traffic light there with that be included in here so we we currently we we currently do a lot of that already um and if if it is determined that it is a speeding issue on one particular road and not and it's a major road like quincy um we would <clears throat> instead of going through this traffic <clears throat> calming process we would look at a stop sign warrant or a truck signal warrant um, and seeing do the speeds, is there a speeding issue? We don't typically use stop signs or <laughs> yield conditions or traffic signals to manage speed though. That is more of handling traffic volumes at an intersection. And would that respond to accidents too as you're analyzing yes. accidents? Accidents, intersections. stop control and yield control and traffic signals do help with accident reduction, but not with speeding if that makes sense. Because people, like you said, it, it's not the intent, but people do ignore stop signs and they blow through them if they're speeding. Or if they are speeding, they may miss that the sign's coming up and they, they blow through that. That's not, in that case, traffic calming would help with that, but a stop sign or a traffic signal may not. Okay, so this process is mainly uh, to manage the speed. Yes. So the, the stop warrants and traffic signal warrants is something that we already do with this as, as a city. Mm -hmm. And that is, again, we'll do the fix it system. Citizens can request, we think that there's a lot of volume or accidents at this one particular intersection and we'll analyze that. We've put in several always stops over near, near the schools over in that area this year um, for, through that exact process. Okay. And I just wanna add, Yes, for speed, but also if situations where you want to enhance pedestrian safety, mm -hmm. you can incorporate a traffic calming device, help pedestrians feel safer mm -hmm. as they're traveling as well. Okay. Well, great. That's my first question. <laughs> I oh. had a second question. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> but this will be quick because in the approval process, you explained very well already earlier. Uh, thanks. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, the only question I re regard that is because I attend some HOA meetings and I realize some of the citizens, they don't really come to the meetings. So what if like this issue involves maybe 
60 families on the street, or maybe let's say 20, 20 families on the street, but only two responded, do you have a percentage of the response rate regarding to your approval process? Because the other 18 may not like the idea. They just didn't, either they didn't get a chance to respond or they didn't see the request, or is there any control process in there say if it's a slow restraint, what do we do? So that, that gets a little bit to what Mr. Bronski was bringing up with the outreach is, okay. is we, when, when we determine an area is viable to be analyzed, we would mail out to everybody who was there, letting them know that we are going through this process. This is what would happen if it went through and we encourage them to get involved we would have the, the open houses. We would have at least two open houses um, encouraging people to attend. Um, if, if it isn't an HOA committee, uh, HOA region, we would encourage the HOA to reach out to their residents, um, letting them know that this is happening. Uh, and when, when we've done all that we can as far as outreach, um, it's up to them to whether if, if they choose not to vote just like in, in in public democracy if they choose not to vote that's on them and if if, if, if they vote for or against whatever the whoever is participating in that vote will be um, what we go with I think you mentioned that it requires, in order to get to an evaluation in a design phase, you have to have 70% or something of the people in the area affected on a petition. Yes. So you're going to have 70% oh, okay. of the people impacted have signed a petition. They're going to be engaged in the process, I would think. And in that, in that instance, we, we encourage the resident who's requesting to go door to door. We, we will, when, when they come to us for a request, we are most likely going to mail out the petition process to everyone in that affected area, letting them know that this is happening and that they can sign the petition through that way. But we will also encourage the resident to go door to door and let the people know that this is happening and get petitions that way. Yep. Sorry, I missed a point earlier, but that's okay. a good answer. Yeah, thank you. That's Mr. All. Uh, two, maybe three questions. Um, first question, standing, who which resident has standing to bring a petition? So do I have to live on that street? Or could I be affected, let's assume the street feeds into my neighborhood and I know they speed over there and they're coming off the bend fast. Do I have standing to go petition? I, I, in that instance, I would say yes. And when the petition comes, the city would look at the study area looking at, okay, it's affecting people on these this street and then this corner street as well. So the study area okay. might be kind of an L shape of homes, you know, off of Mission Ridge onto Leather Top or something. Gotcha. So which answers the second question. The study area is determined by connectivity, it sounds like. Um, within exactly. this traffic we would, we would have an access access study type thing of of what is what is a what is potentially affected. And we would try and incorporate as much of that as we could. Okay. Um, last question on the application retention. Um, it says it's held for two years. So if an eligible application that is approved, it sounds like, but either for budgetary reasons or timing or prioritization does not make it in the first year. Um, why isn't that automatically bumped up to the top of the pack for next year? versus what sounds like they have to go through prioritization so, over again. Yes, sir. The, uh, when it gets through the, the petition process and the city is determining if it's, if it's an eligible thing, um, if, if, we, if we go through the speed study, for example, and we're not seeing any sort of speeding in that area, we, we put out multiple speed uh, trailers or, or speed radars, um, where it's, it's, you, you can't see it and it's just passive collection of data and we're not seeing any sort of speeding issue. Um, if, 
if that year it, it isn't within the budget and then the next year something else comes up that's more important that isn't in the budget and we do see a speeding issue and it just keeps getting bumped, mm -hmm. that's, that's when it would, it would fall off potentially after, after the, the whole. And they period. would have to repetition after this two year. And then yes, we would, ha we would okay. only have to repetition. Okay. Um, if, if for some reason we had a year where there wasn't anything that really came up and we had the budget and this was on our list, even though there, there wasn't a speeding issue that we could see or an accident issue or something like that, that told us that we really need to do something about it. Um, then we would, we would use the budget, the free budget to, okay. to perform the, the analysis or the, the design on that. Thank you. So I think it's worth noting first, thank you for being here because you answered a ton of questions. Um, what we have before us is the presentation of, we're gonna put in place this process, right? They, it's, they, they don't have the final detailed document yet, it lays this specifically out with every document fully formed, but um, the process would have to be integrated into this, so we will get to see what that, a little more detailed. I think it's good that we've asked the questions we did, because then that'll bring that, they'll be able to incorporate some of those questions and thoughts as they're designing this. So great questions, everybody. And we look forward to seeing whatever the, the final is. Commissioner, Commissioner Cali, I'm going to promote you to commissioner. Thanks for the promotion. Hey, we're, all, we're at the dais. <laughs> commissioner Bridges, would you? No, Mr. No, Bell. I just want to add clarification to Commissioner Ratliff's question earlier. The standards do currently limit them to type E, F, and G streets, which are our three lowest classifications. So type E, would you might be familiar with Teen Street or G Avenue. Those are examples of the largest types of streets that may get some type, or may be eligible for some type of traffic calming. And I saw that under project eligibility review. It says it's based on the facility being analyzed. For instance, a collector type E and F street would likely have a larger study area, but it doesn't specifically say in here. Is where you're finding that under the title of uh, neighborhood traffic management and neighborhood references the thoroughfare types. It does. It, it also references certain, a few meetings ago we presented these uh, context zones that are based off the feature land use plan. It references those as well. So the neighborhood context, the mixed use context, and the corner activity context. And that's what really kind of is the boundary. It's just not clear here. And then to our point would be, how would a citizen know that? Right. So I think I'm hearing a lot of questions. Uh, you know, with every ordinance, we have to do a certain level of education and outreach, sure. even above and, beyond, above and beyond what's outlined specifically in the regulation. And so I'm hearing loud and clear, we make sure that we we're being prepared for that when we roll this out and initiate it with the public. It's very clear what process is and how they can find the answer need. I, I think that's key, always. I mean, we sit here, you guys educate us twice a month. Uh, and we have material to read. And uh, I think your general citizen, it's, almost, it's really got to be kind of just so clear. And, you know, you can't answer every question, but... Most of the ones we're asking, even with our experience, are gonna be ones you know the public would ask. So thanks for picking up on that piece. Okay, any other feedback for them? They probably got a volume at this point. Appreciate it so much. As I started off by saying, I, I like that we've got this, we're putting this together. This is needed and necessary, so thank you so much. Anything else? No. Nope. okay, we're good. Is there anybody in the audience that would like to speak on this issue? We do not have any registered speakers. Thank God. Okay. Uh, next item, six. Agenda item number six, discussion and direction. Alignment of multifamily uses in the zoning ordinance with comprehensive plan 2021 via proposed amendments in zoning cases 2022-016 <laughs> and 2022-017. This is discussion and direction regarding the alignment of the zoning ordinance with Comprehensive Plan 2021. Direction provided by the commission will be incorporated into zoning cases 2022-016 and 2022-017 with public hearing scheduled for January 17th, 2023. Applicant is City of Lano. Before you get started, uh, first off, do we have anyone else here to speak on this item? No, we do not. Okay. Um, uh, we can, all right, 
we'll, we'll take a five minute recess. Uh, I think this is going to go really quick anyway. It, I think it's going to be quick. All right. So if you'll, you'll, if you'll do that, that will help me. Um, the last time we went through these, we had a ton of questions and there was a lot of misunder not misunderstandings, but lack of understanding of everything that was being put forward and how this tied back to the comprehensive plan. And we have on here a deadline or a public hearing schedule January 17th, which is two weeks from today. And I'm concerned that this issue was the hottest button of all in the comprehensive plan rework and the commission that spent however long. And I'm thinking we need to maybe take a step back here. Um, I would like to, I think at this time, table this and direct staff to uh, cancel our currently scheduled public hearings on the items. And personally, I would like to, I think it's worth the time and effort to possibly get a joint um, commission and council meeting discussion on this. Because I think it's important that we don't head one direction off P and Z and council perhaps have a different viewpoint on some of the items. Staff's put a ton of effort into it and I don't want to go through this effort or go through the process only for the council then to have a step back and go, this isn't necessarily really in alignment with what we wanted. This is, it's just too big an issue and too sensitive a topic, I think, for us to do that. So I'm going to open that up for some discussion before we get a presentation. They've spent a lot of time on it, but I don't want them to go through it once and have to go through it again uh, or maybe twice more. Um, and I just don't personally, I don't think we're ready for a public hearing January 17th for, for this. So, Commissioner Rapp. Is that a motion to table that you're looking for a second, or is this open for discussion? Is that what you're asking? I, I tell you what, I'm willing to make a motion to table this item, but I do want Commission's input um, before that, and maybe even an, an input from, from staff in terms of how they feel about tabling it, because they put a lot of work into it. So I, maybe we should hear from you first, your thoughts just general around tabling. Is that something, I, I know you're prepared to move forward, but can you see rationale and logic and perhaps having a broader discussion around this topic? Sure. Chair, we are supposed Sorry. to get a second before we discuss, so let's just I didn't do make our... it as a motion. Oh, okay. So we're going to oh. have discussion before <clears throat> there's a motion. I'm just throwing okay. the idea out there. Because okay. if, if there's not enough people interested in doing that, then what's the point of going through that exercise? Okay. So I said I was willing to make a motion. <laughs> But okay. I, I want to get back before we go down that direction. Yes, we will have discussion if we want it after the motion in second, but just in general up front, again, I'm going to ask Mr. Hill if he has any thoughts. Uh, we, have, we have no objection to tabling this discussion to um, schedule something with council at their direction and have a broader conversation on this as chairman did it. A complicated issue it's a sensitive issue to the community so we want to give it its due and um, I know Ms. Sebastian and her team have been working on it we do have a hearing scheduled for the 17th so there will be a hearing on that agenda because it's been noticed but we can, we can table, table it at that or withdraw at that time That's correct but Ms. Sebastian would you like to add any more context I, I think that generally um, that sounds fine um, we we were anticipating trying to get the draft text out of, based on direction um, as soon as possible. At, but, you know, we don't want to spend too much time drafting standards that we don't really have support for. So um, we may balance that in the intervening time until we, we have that meeting. Well, I mean, we've, I can't tell me how many hours have been set at this dais between P and Z, council, public hearings, and everything else. And I just feel like we need more discussion uh, on this particular topic. So that's my general thoughts. Anybody hardline no, that's not a good idea? No, in fact, I think it's, it's a wise idea, and I, I'm in full support of it. I agree. So I move we table item six to Second. allow staff and uh, commission to work potentially with council to create a better format for 
hearing the suggestions and ideas by staff. As the uh, one person from the CPRC, I would happily second it. I think uh, staff has done a great job uh, on a lot of this. And for me, the key sentence was, this report aims to outline the gaps and propose possible amendments to the zoning ordinance that would address all of the gaps. And I think, as you mentioned before, about communication and making sure that everybody understands, I think it's a very wise thing to table. So I'm gladly to second. Okay. We stood there very quietly throughout this whole thing. So now you don't, you don't have to, uh, to do your presentation. I don't know if you're happy or sad about that. <laughs> I'm speechless. I don't know. There's a tear. Happy. Okay. We're good. All right. We have a motion and a second. So a vote yes is to table item six. That item carries seven to zero. Okay. Are you good for another couple of minutes, maybe? He's good. Okay. Item seven. Item seven, discussion and action, election of first and second vice chairs, nomination and election of the first and second vice chairs for the Planning and Zoning Commission. So um, I appreciated the service of Mr. Horn over the last couple of years, and right behind <laughs> him the entire time was Commissioner Carey. I found him to be thoughtful, uh, considerate uh, of all positions, eloquent and uh, asked extremely thoughtful questions. So I would like to make a motion to elect Mr. Carey as our vice chair. Second. Okay, so I have a motion to Mr. Carey as our vice chair with a second by Mr. Brunoff. Um, are you gonna, okay, we're gonna do it up here. I didn't know if we were gonna do a hand vote or not. Mr. Brunoff, there you go, thank you. That's six with one abstention. Mr. Carey will not vote for himself. I was to hear that. <laughs> 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 Mr. Ali? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, along the same lines, uh, th I think the city has been blessed um, by having, you know, nationally recognized staff from the Plan and Zone Department, but also uh, what looks like a deep bench of public servants who bring a unique mixture of public service and personal experience in construction and business. Um, I think it's with that in mind, I would like to nominate one of those um, public servants so that we could leverage his legislative experience, le leverage his personal business experience, um, uh, serving at a state level and also within the city and would love to nominate Commissioner Ratliff uh, for the position of vice chair too. Um, which I think continues the strong tradition that we've had of vice chairs so far. Thank you. Comment, second? Is it possible to nominate anyone else? I second. Okay. Well, there's a motion and a second, so now we'll have discussion on that. Okay. And then go from there. So we have to vote one at a time. We have a one at a time. So the, the, my, my question then would be, if this passes, are we done. We're done. If failed, then we would continue the discussion. Correct. So hmm. I would be interested in hearing other thoughts, but if we got a motion. Uh, unless somebody wants to withdraw their motion. Well, I just don't want anyone to feel like this wasn't a dirt and an opportunity um, for additional discussion. Well, uh, actually, let's have the vote. Let's have we, the vote. I, I could, if, from a discussion on transparency perspective, we, uh, I'm fine with withdrawing to allow further discussion. And post that discussion, we'll come up again with the same motion. Okay, so you withdraw your so motion? So withdraw temporarily. We draw my motion. Okay. I would draw. So you would like to discuss? I would. Um, I think uh, everything Commissioner Ollie said is absolutely accurate. Um, but I think we have another public servant here who has spent a lot of time in Plano in service to the community and, and especially around CPRC. And so I, I would give consideration to another candidate um, being Mr. Commissioner Bronski as well. He spent a lot of time on, um, on the comprehensive plan and has been a great servant of the city in, in that regard over, over several years. And so for those reasons, um, I, I was gonna suggest we consider him as well. 
So maybe that muddies everything up. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not been the first time that's been it's been muddy. Um, I think you're right. There's two very strong candidates here, and, and we can all express, I guess, our opinions of it. Um, uh, Mr. Bronsky is a good friend of mine. We've worked together in a variety of ways, and so I, I appreciate that. I appreciate the experience that he's brought as well to the Comprehensive Plan Review Commission, as well as the dais. Um, and again, he's served in, in a lot of other ways. Um, I tend to lead toward Mr. Ratliff only because of his background in this particular area, which the plan and the, and the ordinances don't always address everything that we need. So that's why I have, I think, in the, at least in this case, not the least of which, too, is, again, his legislative background, his understanding of the political process. So that, that's where I lean, but... If I may add, it's similar, um, I'll, I'll go on probably due to proximity. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm close to Mike and he has shown me one of the better ice cream spots in the city. Uh, so do I definitely agree with uh, the sentiment regarding knowledge and background. Um, main reason for leaning towards Commissioner Ratliff is I have learned a lot to look for things that I quite need to look for listening to him like there are many times i'll come in here having a sense of what i think should be the answer and he brings up a, a different um, aspect to it based on his professional experience and his legislative experience that forces me to reconsider which is why i, I tilt it this way i think it's clear it should be be clear to anyone watching in particular that the role of the second vice chair is to fill in if I was not here and Commissioner Kerry was not going to be here. Uh, it doesn't hold a different weight in terms of a vote. It doesn't hold anything different in that regard. The primary role of a chair is to maintain the agenda, control the meeting, and you know, address potential speakers and stuff like that. So, uh, again, I, I think I would... I don't know if anyone else wants to have anything to say, or we can drop back to. Oh, Commissioner Kerry, your mic's still on? Or... Oh, gotcha. Okay. I'm sorry. No, that's fine. Commissioner Bronson. Just one comment. Uh, the, the role of the second vice chair, we've also eliminated some of, since we're now doing findings, um, yeah. the report that the second vice chair files with uh, the city yeah. council is no longer applicable. That's correct. Commissioner Allen. So I will reinstate my motion uh, to nominate uh, Commissioner Ratliff uh, for Vice Chair 2. And uh, yeah. Do you want a second again? I second. Okay. Uh, but there's a discussion. I thought if we had two nominations, are we just going to move and pick one and go with it, or are we supposed to vote between the two nominations? Well, we now have a motion and a second for Commissioner okay. Ratliff, and okay. we will vote on that. Oh, okay. 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 So, and if it fails, then there can be another motion. Yes. Oh, okay. 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 So we got, <laughs> we can all still go have a drink after this, guys. This is, okay. And that item carries six to zero with one abstention, Mr. Ratliff. Mr. Bronski, real class. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And Commissioner Kerry, thank you for pushing out there. Hey, let's have another discussion. I think it's worthwhile. Yeah, my, my point was I think uh, Commissioner Brown has done a lot for the city. But it Absolutely. doesn't, it's, it's, I'm in full support of Bennett um, for all the reasons, but uh, I thought it was worthy of discussion. Uh, thank you for, thank you for doing that. And I apologize if I got us into an awkward situation there. That wasn't my intention. Item eight, items for future agendas. Seeing none, we are adjourned at 4 p.m. Thank you, everybody, for your time. Now you have a longer break. <laughs>